The Three Theorems of Psychohistorical Quantitivity The population under scrutiny is oblivious to the existence of the science of psychohistory. The time periods dealt with are in the region of three generations. The population must be in the billions for a statistical probability to have psychohistorical validity. Hello everybody and welcome to the first episode of Foundation Analysis. This is a uh, supplementary podcast for uh, the Foundation series by Apple TV based off uh, the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov. I have loved the series since I was a teenager and the TV show came out and I felt compelled to, uh, to put my thoughts out there and Hopefully you all will find it interesting and entertaining to hear what I have to say. It's just going to be me, Brent, doing the uh, podcast here, so it'll be a single voice, a little different energy, trying something different. Let me know what works, let me know what doesn't. So for those of you who are here because Foundation, uh, my name is Brent Stewart. I uh, do On the Origin of Battle Mechs podcast, a podcast about uh, the Battle Mechs in the Battletech universe. And uh, this is the first non-Battletech project I'm doing here right now. And uh, I went to school at my local college, and I have a diploma as a mechanical engineering technologist. I also work as a shipping and receiver, and I do this for fun on the side. We have a neat little community, uh, mostly centered around Battletech, but uh, mostly also good people. If you have any interest of stompy robots, I recommend you check out the other show. Now, for everybody here from On the Origin, hi, you know who I am, so that part was redundant. And uh, I have been a fan of Foundation since I was a teenager. I have read the first book at least six times, the first trilogy at least three uh, you know, it's it's a great work. I think it is fantastic. I haven't reread it in a while, so I'm going to be going off memory. Uh, this show will include spoilers for the uh, episode of the TV show and uh, the books. Just kind of a blanket spoiler warning now right out in front, so be aware. And yeah, I think that is where we are going to end the introduction and warnings and uh, we're going to start talking about the show. So we start with episode one, The Emperor's Peace, and uh, the show starts directly with the intro, no pre-title sequence, and it is a very distinctive style. We will learn what type of style it is in the coming episode, and it is uh, quite interesting. It's showing scenes or portraying scenes of uh, things that will happen, uh, but of course we don't know this yet. It is quite interesting, and uh, yeah, it looks really, really good. It's very stylized. Uh, it's clearly CG, but the stylization works quite well in its favor. And then we cut to uh, the narration by our protagonist. We are introduced to the galaxy and how it, it spans. Human space spans all of it, essentially. We have stars end at the very edge of the galaxy. And then we are told about Terminus somewhere even further away, which is a quite interesting because uh, you know the human empire is supposed to be quite large and all-encompassing. And so if it's not part of it, then it's uh, that's a big thing. Another thing is that our protagonist is uh, Gal Dornick, which in the books is male, and in the TV show is female, and so that is a change. I think it's a good one. There's no reason that the character had to be male as far as I can recall in the books, so that's cool. I think that representation is great and important, and so I am all here for that because, I mean, ultimately this story is celebrating intellect, intelligence, planning, knowledge. That is, that is what is lofted, and that can come from anywhere and everywhere. So there's no reason it has to be a male character, at least in the books, as far as I can recall. So we have the narration about the galaxy and then Terminus, and we cut to a speeder shooting across a desolate, frozen wasteland. 
We then transition to a uh, young child sneaking out of his residence while what is assumed to be his caretaker is asleep, uh, meeting up with another friend and then two more, and establishing that the world is very desolate and large and full of dangers because we are informed of something called of a bishop claw. And they group of children are approaching a thing called the vault for a kind of rite of passage. They have little flags to see how close they can get and plant them before having to return because the vault is this monolith, for lack of a better term. It is uh, triangular designs, very tall, long, floating in the air, and there's two of them creating kind of a negative space in between them, mirroring it, and it projects a null field, which prevents all humans and, in fact, all living things from getting close to it. Now, I know what everyone is thinking, because I thought it as well, but uh, having listened to the podcast that is put out by production, it is uh, very clearly stated that that's not the obvious thing what you think, so it'll be interesting to see what it is. But uh, we are also introduced to the Warden, who is a character uh, which is going to be probably quite important, given their name which we uh, are given a last name for, uh, Harden. And then we cut to a classic Greek or Roman pantheon arch direction with a narration of Salvar Harden, Haber Malo, the mule. The mule, I mean, that should make everybody make pa- take pause because the mule is a pretty pivotal character in the foundation series so and we cut to 35 years earlier where we establish the first of our pantheon we will say harry selden who is then mentioned in name as having many titles that he could lay claim to and he is portrayed in a classic library in the middle of the night very stoic working on a data pad in some sort of sketch that is also math, which is intriguing. There is a uh, meeting between his son, which is sort of clandestine. It, uh, you know, it they are speaking weighted words without actually being specific about what is going on, mostly just that it is the optimal time and they wish that there was another way. We then cut to Synax, which is uh, described in the books as being provincial, and that's kind of it, pastoral almost. So we this is much more description. It is a water planet. It is quite interesting. We see Gale uh, Dornick, our protagonist, cupping some stones, six in her palm, reciting numbers, which we will soon learn is her liturgy, we'll call it. And uh, she is memorizing the view from her bedroom window because she is leaving never to return for reasons that are not explained. There is a wonderfully acted out scene between uh, her and her mother. And, you know, you can stay, I can't, but you can come with me. That sort of tug and pull and, you know, each of our lives are separate. It is very well done. Kudos to the actors. And we see Gail get onto a shuttle on a landing pad that is covered over in water, which we will learn why later, and head up into space. So we transition to the jump ship, a imperial jump ship, it is important to note, because uh, something that is not clearly explained is that the only people who actually have jump technology is the Empire. At this point, everybody else has slow ships, is what they're called, basically ones that can go approaching the speed of light. So we see Gale uh, getting suited up in a flight suit for the jump, and passengers have to be sedated because spacers, who appear to be these augmented humans, are the only ones who can be awake during the jump. And it is uh, quite interesting because a little webbing sort of thing covers every passenger. Mid-jump, Gale wakes up, which is startling to one of the crew, and they ask, why is she awake? She is woozy, so it's not like she has an answer. And uh, she wakes up on the other end, and continues to talk with a character that was introduced pre-jump, uh, who, will, who we will learn more about later. They are kind of like a foil 
for at this point for uh, exposition, you know, like uh, fish out of water, someone for the new traveler to bounce off of, and their performance is fantastic. They then go through the uh, space elevator, which is quite interesting as a concept. It's really cool. The idea is that you have a, a weight or station at the end of a tether uh, that is in geosynchronous orbit with the planet, and the tension that is put on the tether can be used as a line basically to move up and down from the surface of the planet to orbit you are wasting less energy achieving uh, exit velocity because you are further up and able to get out easier uh, it is a cool sci-fi thing it is theoretically possible i don't think there's any plans for it right now in the world but it'd be real cool anyway this obviously has a giant processing station because this is a hub for Trantor, the Eye of the Empire, the center. And uh, Trantor in the books is a massive planet completely covered in cities. Basically, it is one giant metropolis where it has the population of literally hundreds of planets on it. And each section is its own enclave, community, etc. that has its culture and preferences and all of that. And they are all stacked on top of each other like a layers of pancakes. And occasionally there's a waffle in there or something. And it's very interesting and kooky and... Uh, I think a product of its time in the books, but it's a neat to read, and uh, those can be read about in the prequel uh, books. And uh, Gail uh, informs us by her processing that she is here to work with Harry Seldon and that she is not going back and uh, that this is her home now. And she starts to head down to the floor, quote unquote, of Trantor. Because, as I said, it is just built on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other. So, uh, you gotta go real deep to get to the actual, like, bedrock of the planet now. At least in the books. The show makes it feel less deep, if that makes sense. And so we get to look down at the world of Trantor as the elevator starts to descend, showing the majesty and the epicness of the things that the Empire can build, or has built in the past, to be more specific. Uh, we then cut to a shot of the Royal Palace with the character of uh, Demrazel, played by Laura Brynn, who is absolutely fantastic in this role. She's very interesting, and as soon as you see her, you're like, hmm something there it is great and then we are introduced to brother day or empire as the clone of cleon the first and uh, he approaches a uh, artisan who is working on the mural in the palace and uh, broaches the subject of Harry Seldon and that they found a recording in his apartment or living quarters and uh, there's a back and forth and it's a great scene because uh, Lee Pace, who plays the Empire or the clones of Cleon, does a great job of just being very affable and personable and then having it turn, which is very unnerving in a in a very entertaining way and works for the character and the artisan is uh, executed by a guard with a uh, blaster we'll say they don't, haven't really given a description which uh, important note on Trantor only imperial guards or military can have uh, blasters uh, so that is going to be a note for later we then have a scene with the uh, brothers who are of course all clones of cleon the first uh who are gestated and put forth at a certain age sta or at a certain time uh staggered so that there is a cycle there is a brother dawn a brother day and a brother dusk and as you know one starts to age it is implied that day is the ruler dusk advises and the two of them teach dawn we see a dinner scene where they are eating a opulent meal of roast peacock and there is a uh, a lot of really good cool moments uh, as well as choreography where the three clones all kind of react to something in unison in the same way which is uh, very good and really shows the acting ability of all of the characters and like really gives you the feel that these are 
the same person. An interesting note about the uh, change from the books is that we have the clone system here where, uh, you know, we have Cleon the First who clones himself and set up a genetic dynasty literally of himself, introducing no genetic variance, no intentionally no change of thought, essentially, because he is the same person kind of stuck in a loop being taught by himself which is a great representation of one of the major themes of the series which is stagnation because like not only is he aristocracy separated from not only the people of his planet but the people of his empire but he is a genetic throwback he's no longer concurrent with the people around him because he is a clone of someone from 400 years ago an important note and a great use of uh, the theme of stagnation. Then we have Brother Don with Demrazel meeting the two delegations from the periphery uh, who, uh, you know, we get some world building, they hate each other, war is expensive, uh, etc. Politics and all of that sort of stuff. And then we get to the bottom of the space elevator, which is a long trip, and we have uh, Gail go out and start looking for, well, Reich, our character, who is uh, Reich Selden, the son of Harry Selden, which we have seen already before. And uh, there's some great character moments, them building a rapport. She asks to see a church uh, of her now ex-religion, uh, and he says he thinks that they can do that because there is still one. We then have the delegations entering the uh, palace. They see the mural that was uh, the setting for the execution scene before. There is comments about it from one of the delegations in their native tongue, which causes some consternation with uh, Dem, because uh, I'm guessing they understand what uh, the, was said. We don't, but they did. And then we have Gail and... And then we have Gail enter the library to meet Harry for their first sit-down meeting. This, of course, is uh, an interesting scene, uh, a fencing of wills, because we learn some backstory about each of them, mostly that uh, Synax is uh, not great to those with a scientific inclination, and that Gail would have been arrested for reasons. And then we have, of course... Jared Harris as Harry Seldon, who is absolutely fantastic, inhabits the role amazingly. He gets to play with his prime radiant a little bit and uh, fence with the words. I mean, it's just amazing casting because he's great in these sorts of roles. If you haven't seen Chernobyl, I highly recommend it. And the sh scene ends with uh, Harry giving Gail the uh, original manuscript of uh, the important work that was solved, was used to solve the uh, Braxis equation, which got her to where she is now. And uh, there's a little moment, which is great, which is, uh, you know, like she says, she can't take it. And Harry tells her that uh, this library, this planet will fall. Stealing it is a mercy because it might survive then. The might survive is implied. Uh, so, no, it's a really cool scene. Really great. I very much enjoy it. We then have the presentation of the gifts from the two delegations in the throne room with uh, Brother Day, Brother Dawn, and Brother Dusk. And uh, it is uh, pomp and circumstance and stuffy and regalia, etc., etc. A lot of really cool set design and uh, costume work was put into this. And we get to see kind of Brother Day's administration style, which is a touch heavy-handed and uh, lacking in decorum, we will say. He throws around the fact that they don't have a choice to be here, etc., etc., and uh, it is interesting to have that be one of the first interactions we see politically, which sets the tone for how the Empire conducts itself. And then we cut to a private scene in the back where the uh, brothers are discussing the gifts. It's a teachable moment to Brother Dawn and about how the machinations of communications and subtlety, etc., etc., which is uh, quite nice and uh, shows a familiar bond between the brothers. 
even if they are the same person and separated by decades. And Brother Dusk recommends to Brother Day that maybe the stick is not a bad idea to use with uh, Selden and the girl. And then we have uh, some scenes where Gail is established as a character with her previous life in religion on Synax, and uh, then she is arrested and uh, eventually we go to the courtroom where uh, there is a call for Harry to take the stand and this is being broadcast to the population which is reminiscent of a scene in the prequel trilogy or prequel books uh, where kind of the project of psychohistory is announced, which of course would invalidate it, uh, given the quote that is at the beginning of the episode. And so uh, it is disproven as inconclusive or, you know, not accurate, therefore making it sound like it's a hoax, wherein that the population can then be properly predicted again, if I'm remembering correctly. And of course, we get the required scene of Jared Harris as Harry Seldon monologuing on the stand, which is absolutely fantastic. There's a great moment I particularly love where he says, you know, consider the outer reach and the court is like, oh, we're not here to talk about that. It's not important. And he's like, no, everything's important because everything is connected, which is true. And I think a lot of people overlook things. Lots of stuff can be rounded off as inconsequential or a mitigating factor. But if you have enough small mitigating factors, eventually they build up. So you got to have to be aware of everything if you want to be an effective ruler of a galactic empire. Anyway, all joking and uh, hi hyperbole aside, it is an amazing scene. Jared Harris, whenever he gets to uh, monologue on the stand, is fantastic. And the story, the myth, the purpose of this is to let them know that the fall is coming 500 years if nothing is done to change things. And uh, if nothing is done, it'll be a dark age for 30,000 years. But if we do the right moves, we can shorten it to a thousand, which is perspectively quite good. So, you know, theoretically, we have a time span of 1500 years to work with if they can extend the length of the empire longer then that thousand years might be pushed back and or technically shortened as it is a wave that washes across the galaxy as opposed to a continual flicking on and off of things all at once and then we cut from the courtroom scene to Gal Donick being uh, escorted to the gardens, where she is interviewed, talked with uh, the character we met on the transport, who turns out to be a spy. And she is given the proposition of uh, disavow Harry Selden and get to live your life wherever you want in the grace of the Empire, or don't, and you die. And she's given the Prime Radiant and one day to figure it out which not a lot of time to crunch those numbers there champ uh <laughs> pro probably need you know g give it a week just saying we then cut back to the courtroom the next day and uh, she's given a proper dressing down and uh, more world building and exposition about her home planet and honestly if it wasn't to help give context to who she is for the audience it would be cruel and unusual of the court to allow that but uh, that's just my hot take. She confirms that Harry Seldon's math is uh, correct, and uh, this, of course, is broadcast to the Empire, which I have no idea why they're broadcasting these proceedings, because that is literally doing what they are trying to prevent. Uh, you know, closed hearings, etc., etc. Damage is already done. And then we have a uh, scene that is straight out of sci-fi horror uh or sci-fi final destination the space elevator or tether is cut by two bombs uh that are set off and uh the tether literally falls and wraps its way around the planet carving into the levels below creating a swath of fire and destruction and there is a amazing shot of it panning from right to left where it has started to fall and is carving in and things are beginning to settle and as it pans you see it still settling still going off and then eventually it's still descending 
so you can see where it is going to land and the the scale of that sort of event is horrifying which is why they say that it changed everything and that is why gail and harry are brought to the palace once again to uh have a sit down with with empire or the brothers to discuss the future a uh, ver- fantastic verbal fencing between Brother Day and uh, Harry Seldon about what the future and what what each of them can offer each other in the abstract of ideological perspectives and solutions to the events that just unfurled, like the cord that is wrapping itself around Trantor. And there's some fantastic lines. Anybody who has watched the episode, I'm sure, can tell. Uh, And it is put forth that they can uh, extend the length of the Empire by a couple centuries and shorten the fall. And that uh, this is really a good move because it would secure the Empire's legacy in the future to come. But the Emperor Brother Day is, of course, hesitant because... The only two people who can prove each other right or wrong are on the same side, and who's to say that they're not out for their own game, as it were. One thing that is put forward is to end Imperial cloning in order to extend the length of the Empire, and that, uh, you know, they don't offer anything new, that uh, it is the same old, same old, the stagnation theme, as I mentioned, which is uh, good. It's just, like I said, a fantastically well-acted scene, really, really good. Uh, we then get a scene with Harry and Gail Dornick uh, while they are being listened to in a conference room about, uh, you know, saying, was it a fair fight and fencing and saying things without actually saying them. And uh, it is really quite interesting and good. Like these these two are great on screen. More of this, you know. <laughs> we then go again to a meeting with Brother Day and Harry Selden, and uh, the verdict is in. It is exile. They are being sent off to Terminus, and there is the alluded, you know, you will either succeed or you will fail and die out there. And if you succeed, what you make will be ours, which, uh, you know, makes the empire feel like it is winning and then as gail and harry are leaving harry is able to rattle off all these uh stats about terminus and is able to impart all of this knowledge on the fly which tips off to gail that it was always part of the plan there's a bunch of machinations moving that we are unaware of and uh, over that sort of monologue we cut again to 35 years forward where we have a quick little digression about salvor who uh is approaching the vault and we talk about the vault and what is in it and how is it part of the plan do we know what it is we don't know and it's a great cliffhanger to end the first episode on. So, yeah, lots of really cool stuff. I highly recommend the show. I think it's great. Uh, lots of cool, interesting divergences from the books. Because, well, the books are great, but they are very much books. They are their medium. They uh, also are of their time. And so they need a bit of a spit polish and shine and reworking to uh, be a little more accessible to today's audiences. And I think so far, uh, Apple TV has done a bang-up job. All right, well, hope you all tune in for the next episode. Bye. This project is supported by the On the Origin of Battlemex podcast Patreon. If you enjoy it and want to hear more of my discussion of Foundation, please let me know and possibly give your support there. Special thanks to my friend Treble for the intro and outro. Don't you see? It's galaxy-wide! It's a worship of the past, a deterioration, a stagnation. Politically, which sets the tone for how the Empire conducts itself. Crooks.